Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Portola Valley Nature and Science Committee speaker series. I'm really pleased to have Tom Blyer, our local geologist uh, who has been studying earthquakes here in uh, Portola Valley for a very long time. Um, he's got a project he's been working on for 21 years uh, called Quake Finder and um, uh, is, has been living in Portola Valley for for, since 1973, he built his house in 72 and moved in in 73. So um, uh, that was uh, after he got a double E at Clarkson University. But he spent most of his time in satellites and was applying, applying his satellite and engineering skill to the uh, subject of earthquakes. So Tom, I, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to hear about your, your findings and uh, take it away. Okay, Bonnie, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, sorry for the delay for the other folks that had problems with us also, but we will start now. So Quake Finder, this is a project that we have. Uh, it's actually a humanitarian project started by Stellar Solutions uh, under Celeste Ford. Uh, we started about the year 2000. Um, this was a, uh, an effort to give back to the community using our satellite engineering skills to approach a very difficult problem. And that is, is there a different way of forecasting earthquakes that might give you days of warning rather than seconds or 30 year warnings? So if you have any questions uh, at the bottom of the screen is my email address, Tom Blyer at, or I'm sorry, T Blyer at quakefinder.com. If we can't answer your questions, uh, send me an email and I'll, I'll certainly answer the questions there. So proceeding, earthquake forecasting. This is a really tough problem, by the way. Uh, the fact that we've been working on it for 21 years is actually pretty short compared to uh, USGS and other people that have been working on it much longer than that. But it's interesting to step back and look at other natural hazards, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes and landslides. And one of the realizations you come to is that they had just as difficult a time forecasting those uh, as we do, but a fundamental change occurred when new technology was invented. In the case of hurricanes, we had geosynchronous weather satellites, we had supercomputers, we had uh, modeling where we could take huge amounts of data together and actually see and forecast when, an earth, when a uh, hurricane would uh, hit a landfall. In the case of uh, tornadoes, um, it wasn't until Doppler radar was invented by the military that you could actually see the formation of a tornado starting day or night. You didn't have to actually see it. You could see it through this radar system. And more recently, uh, the GOES weather satellite can actually see lightning that is formed by the top of the uh, tornado. Uh, volcanoes have uh, seismometers, they have interferometric synthetic aperture radar that can actually map the expansion of the uh, cone of the uh, volcano and see when it's getting ready to, uh, to break. And likewise, uh, uh, landslides. So when we tried to look at earthquakes, however, it has been elusive to say the least. For hundreds of years, we've tried to do this. Um, around uh, the turn of the century, 1900 to 2000, or before 1800 to, to 1900, we started using seismometers. This was a good way of documenting when an earthquake actually happened. And then if you add on top of that GPS, Global Positioning System, you can actually map the uh, individual fault traces to see how they uh, are building up stress and strain and light, LIDAR or light radar will actually give you even more uh, resolution. Interferometric synthetic aperture radar was hopefully going to be a, a major milestone in that. And it really shows exactly after the earthquake how much of the ground has deformed by looking at these rings. Unfortunately, we didn't see those rings happening before the earthquake. So all of these things have one thing in common. They're mechanical. They're looking at mechanical things and trying to determine patterns of earthquakes, but it isn't working. So why not try something totally different? 
And getting back to the word forecasting, we don't like to use prediction so much because that implies knowing precisely the, the second that the earthquake's gonna happen. Forecasting is like weather forecasting. You're looking at probabilities. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that USGS does a wonderful job keeping track of earthquakes, looking at the, the uh, increasing of stress through GPS monitoring of the crustal uh, faults. Uh, and they look at this from a statistical standpoint, saying that in a 30-year probability, you might have a 70% chance of an earthquake in, let's say, the Bay Area. On the left-hand side of the screen, fairly new now, um, UC Berkeley and UC uh, and USGS, along with University of Washington, came up with using the basic seismometer network that already existed <clears throat> and tying those together with computers such that when an earthquake happens and two or three seismometers picks it up, it will send a message to the computer. It will say that, that the earthquake is large or small and it'll tell you uh, as you go away from the earthquake, how many seconds it'll be before it hits you, especially the S wave or the shear wave that causes more damage. Unfortunately, if you happen to be at the epicenter, you get zero warning. And that's typically where most of the uh, damage and loss of life occurs. So, you know, we're looking for something that's a little bit better than that, although it's good, we need something better. So in the middle, we're trying to use something that will fundamentally change the way we look at the earthquake preparation process. We're getting down to the actual atoms, if you will, of the crust to see what happens when they start to break. And specifically, we're looking for electromagnetic monitoring uh, techniques that might be able to give us that insight. Well, electromagnetic earthquake precursors, what the heck are those things? Well, if you look at sort of a model of the earth, we're basically a rigid crust sitting on a liquid core. The uh, plates that are sitting on this floating core tend to move and they tend to build up stress to the point where they have to rupture and cause an earthquake. What we're actually trying to do though, is to see if the, that process generates any electromagnetic energy. The energy that has started to show up in numerous uh, scientific papers are illustrated on this chart. You can see glowing patterns uh, like earthquake lights uh, that are a result of increasing air conductivity. There's deep underground currents that are happening that create magnetic field changes at ultra low frequencies. There's a change in the ionosphere that charge particle uh, layer about 100 to 600 kilometers above us filled with electrons and positive particles, those actually start to decrease or thin out over an earthquake area and radio transmissions that bounce off of that ionosphere change. Also, there is infrared energy. So there's this whole uh, smorgasbord, if you will, of electromagnetic indicators. And the process that we're trying to do is to sort through all of this and come up with a logical way of looking at them. Let's start with earthquake lights. Now you may have heard about this. This is sort of a, a unique feature where prior to an earthquake or during an earthquake, both of them happen, you'll get a flash of light across the horizon. It looks like a lightning strike, except that there may not be any clouds in the sky. And it looks like it's coming from the ground and going upwards. I got interested in this in uh, the mid 70s when I heard a, uh, a talk by USGS, John Durer, and he had some photographs from a um, Japanese gentleman that happened to be walking down a, a, uh, a, a road in the middle of nowhere, he happened to have a camera on board and he saw this light flash and took a picture of it. We started to get these pictures from a number of sources, but today everybody has cameras. And I'm going to show you an actual set of earthquake lights. Now, this is a picture from a security camera in Lima, Peru, South America, looking from the Catholic University in Lima out towards the ocean, looking westward. You can see a flash there in the horizon there. 
that happened to be a P wave coming from a distant earthquake 100 kilometers away, rolling through the Lima area. And there was a second flash there that was the S wave from that earthquake. Now that earthquake was 100 kilometers away. It rolled up the um, shoreline, hitting these earthquake lights all the way until it hit Lima. And there was actually a second earthquake that happened right after that. And we're gonna see those two flashes also. Again, the P wave and the S wave are rolling up the coastline, about to hit Lima, Peru. We're looking west towards the ocean. There's an island out there, kind of like Alcatraz and an island in the bay, as if we were on Knob Hill looking at Alcatraz. We're in Lima looking out towards San Lorenzo Island. Here is a second earthquake shaking the camera. We're about to see the P wave hit that area out in the coast. There it is, and the S wave which is the largest one of these pulses is about to hit. And it's right about now. So what are these flashes of light and how are they generated? Well, we have a, a colleague down there at the university and we got talking about it. We said, hey, we know the direction that that flash came from, from the PUCP uh, university in the upper left, we have a vector coming out towards the ocean. There was a uh, military uh, naval officer on San Lorenzo Island. We got in contact with him and he said, yeah, I saw it too at this uh, azimuth angle. And then we called the tower at the Lima airport and asked if there were any pilots landing. Sure enough, there was a uh, private pilot landing a small plane and we got in touch with him and he said, yeah, I, I saw the flash too at, at this azimuth. When we put the three vectors together, it was obvious that this flash came from the ocean just before, just in front of San Lorenzo Island. It did not come from power lines that happened to be slapping together, you know, as the, uh, as the uh, PVNS wave went through Lima. It actually was vectored into the ocean area which made it even more strange because the ocean is full of conductive fluid. So let's come back to California for a second. What did we see in California? By we, I mean Tony Fraser Smith, the head of the radio science department of Stanford University. He was doing a scientific study looking at ultra low frequency radio waves that they use to talk to submarines who are underneath the salt water and able to pick up these radio waves at around 70 Hertz. He was looking for a sweet spot in the electromagnetic spectrum that might be even better than 70 Hertz. So he started looking from essentially DC all the way up to 10 or 20 Hertz. It was too noisy at Stanford University. So he had a magnetometer and he moved it to Coralitos in the Santa Cruz mountains. Well, interestingly enough, that's where the Loma Prieta earthquake happened. He was about five miles from the epicenter of that large earthquake, magnitude seven or so. When he looked at the data after the earthquake, he noticed that the lowest frequency, 0.01 Hertz. So if you can imagine a sine wave that starts and it ends up 100 seconds later, that's a very slow moving wave, magnetic wave. And it showed up 11 days before the earthquake, was still active for about to minus five days, and then it went mysteriously quiet. Didn't know why, but three hours before the earthquake, it went up to 60 times the background energy level that that frequency band had been recording. The power went out, so there's a gap in the data. And then after the uh, earthquake, these aftershocks would occur and, and tickle at that frequency range again. Unfortunately, Tony didn't have a lot of storage capacity in his computer. So he was mathematically combining all of the energy over 30 minute averages. So we never got to see what the magnetic field was actually doing. We just knew what the average of the energy was. And of course that was only one earthquake. So, is my computer not? There we go. One of the other criticisms of that study was 
what is the theory behind all of this? Why did the uh, ground emit these kind of uh, low frequency magnetic noise? Well, enter a guy named Friedemann Freund from uh, NASA Ames, who's a material scientist, essentially a crystallographer. Friedemann was wondering about electromagnetic energy inside of rocks, and he decided to do some experiments where he took a slab of granite about eight or 10 feet long, and he compressed it at one end with some hydraulic pistons at a, almost the breaking point of the granite around 40 to 60,000 uh, pounds. And then he put a, a uh, an electrical pickup at the other end and joined it with a wire to an amp meter to see what kind of currents might be um, picked up. Now, this is not piezoelectricity that people may have heard of where you squeeze a crystal and get a little bit of a charge out of it. This is actually generating an ongoing current that followed the contour of the, um, of the uh, stress as it was going up the, uh, the hydraulic cylinder stress. The, uh, the current followed that same pattern. And it was interesting because it was repeatable. He could do this thing 30 or 40 times. And every time he did it, he got a current going through the, uh, the rock. It's counterintuitive. Most people think of a rock as an insulator, not as a, um, as a conductor, much less a battery that's generating this current. But there seemed to be a repeating pattern that he, that he found here. So now we've got a laboratory experiment that shows that currents can go through rock. We have earthquake lights showing these currents are big. They're generating huge amounts of air ionization. And we've got magnetic signatures that Tony Fraser Smith picked up. Friedman put all of this together and said, hey, this is nothing more than a large semiconductor, just like we do in our electronics. Instead of an electric field changing the current, it's a changing stress that releases peroxy bonds and creates charge carriers called P-holes or positive hole carriers that emit and start uh, emanating towards the surface. The transmission of those charge particles are about 300 meters per second, which is kind of like the acoustic velocity. So this is not speed of light type of, uh, like a wire with a current going down it. This is a slow moving charge that's migrating to the surface. Electrons are, are coming backwards in this thing and creating a, a loop, if you will, a current loop. When you look at Tony Fraser Smith's amplitude of the magnetic field here, and you consider that it was about 10 miles below the surface, if you passed a current through a wire 10 miles below the surface, how big would that current have to be to create that magnetic field? And the answer is 1 million amperes. So this is like a full-blown lightning strike, only it's happening underground and it's coming upwards. Really quirky. <laughs> Well, being an engineer and not believing all of the laboratory experiments, kind of chiding Friedemann Freund a little bit, who's standing here on the left, I'm standing on the right, we decided to do an experiment together. I happened to own a piece of property in Bass Lake. That property had a seven ton sort of round boulder sitting on a hillside, ready to roll down right into my new uh, cabin that we had built. So we had to get rid of this thing. And rather than try to blow it up with dynamite, we decided to do an experiment. So I rented a jackhammer, jumped up on top of the boulder and put in uh, five holes about three feet deep, two inches in diameter. And we filled those holes with a substance called Bustar. And Bustar is an expanding concrete that's kind of like water when it freezes inside of a rock, it breaks the rock. Bustar does it very systematically over about an eight hour period without dynamite. So it stresses the rock tremendously to the point where it breaks. And you can see on the right hand side where the rock did break and finally. What we did is we put a magnetometer here on the right side and a magnetometer on the left side. We put a, a large capacitor on the surface of the rock and we hung a ion sensor on a clothesline above the rock, not touching it. We poured this at 10 o'clock at night. When we got the data the next day, we started looking at it. A 
around midnight, we could see that the ion sensor was going crazy. There were ions coming out of the rock on the top of it, both positive and negative. Over here on the right, we noticed magnetic pulses that were occurring randomly, two seconds wide, three, four seconds wide. And this sinusoid here is actually a calibration signal that we inject into the magnetometer starting at midnight for about five minutes. So we know this sample was exactly at midnight, two hours after we poured the concrete. And it, we, were, we were detecting these brand new magnetic pulses that we had never seen before. So what do we got now? We've got magnetic pulses. We got ultra low frequency magnetic fields, 100 seconds long. We got air ionization, both positive and negative. Other people were telling us that they could detect ionospheric changes around 500 miles above the, uh, uh, about 100 miles above the ground, over about a 500 to 1,000 mile diameter. We've got earthquake lights. Uh, deep water wells have ionized water coming out of it. And other things like um, uh, infrared energy, which we'll talk about a little bit later. These are all of the different electromagnetic things like a symphony coming out of the rocks. Well, who's doing the research? Is it just us magnetometers uh, with a quake finder? Not exactly. If you read all the papers, there's about 400 scientists worldwide doing various electromagnetic monitoring prior to earthquakes. So we're doing magnetometers and ions, a little bit of infrared work. Chapman University and LA is doing IR. JPL really had some interesting work that helped us. We'll show that in a few minutes. Uh, Russia, China, Italy, Taiwan, they're all in the business to be able to pick up these electromagnetic signals. QuakeFinder started simply with a couple of monitors in the Bay Area, but over a period of 15 years, we built this network of 125 sites. Each site is, can pick up signals over a 20 mile diameter. So each of these circles are 20 miles. They're located along the San Andreas Fault, the Hayward and Calaveras Fault, San Jacinto, Elsinore Faults, and up into the Sierras. And because we're not getting enough earthquakes to satisfy our curiosity, actually, we like to see earthquakes, but don't say anything about that. Peru, Taiwan have a lot more earthquakes than we do, as does Chile, a little bit of Greece and Sumatra. So we put sensors out there too. Coming back to the Bay Area, this is kind of way it looks. The red line here is the San Andreas Fault. Right there is where the 1906 earthquake happened. Uh, down a little bit lower in the Santa Cruz Mountains is where the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake happened. And we're putting these yellow dots, these yellow indicators of our sensors every 20 miles along the uh, San Andreas and major faults. And over here on the East Bay also in the Calaveras Fault. But you might notice that there's no yellow dots along the Hayward Fault, which by the way, may actually uh, happen before the other ones. The reason for that is that Bay Area Rapid Transit put their train tracks almost on top of the Hayward Fault all the way down here. And there's so much magnetic noise generated by the trains that we couldn't do it. So we created a mini monitor that only has ion sensors and not magnetometers. And we made a STEM project out of it. We built a kit with the electronics and the ion sensors, and we gave it to seven, seven high schools. We picked those high schools because they were along the Hayward Fault. And each one of them now has a student built ion detector in their uh, school yard picking up data along the Hayward Falls. Another way to get kids involved in this. So here's what a sensor looks like on top of the ground. Our sensors have uh, three magnetometers buried in the ground. The magnetometers are about uh, three feet, two feet or one feet long, depending on sensitivity. We have positive and negative ion sensors, which are these little canisters geophone that tells us if the ground is moving because that contaminates the magnetic noise on the uh, sensors. We get the data back uh, 32 samples per second on every channel through cell phone modems, about three gigabytes per month, and it's solar powered so we don't have to be close to an electric outlet. 
Um, the mini stations just have the uh, ion sensors, these two canisters down here, and they're uh, AC powered so they can plug into the school. So what, did, what happened? Did we find any earthquakes? Well, we started in 2000. We waited seven long, long years before we had an earthquake near any of our sensors. Uh, 2007 was the Alum Rock earthquake, about 10 or 15 miles east of Milpitas, up in the Calaveras Fault area. It was a nice earthquake, 5.4, biggest one since uh, Loma Prieta. And we had really good data. The sensors worked terrifically. Uh, over the, uh, the year prior to this, we would see on average about 10 pulses per day and these pulses were similar to the ones that we saw in that rock fracture. They were about one to three seconds wide. They could be positive or they could be negative. They were not bi-directional. We call them unipolar pulses because they only went up and then decayed back down without going very negative. And it was sort of like a fingerprint. So whenever we saw those, we counted them. And we noticed that over time, um, past the average, there'd be a little periods of activity, maybe a couple hours, maybe even a day long, but they would go away. It was like the fault was moving, it was cracking, it was creating these little bursts of current, but it wasn't sustained long enough to actually create an earthquake until we got close to the magnitude 5.4. Then we saw clustering. These pulses became much more uh, active on a per day basis. And that was interesting to us because they went away after the earthquake too. In terms of air conductivity, Freedom and Freud said, hey guys, these currents and these charge carriers migrate to the surface and they ionize the air. You can't see it, you can't smell it, but if a dog was sleeping on the grass there, his fur would, would, um, would stand on end, just like you were touching a Van de Graaff generator. So we created, um, uh, ion sensors that were calibrated. Uh, they drew air through them and measured the current across the, uh, the uh, sensors, and we could pick, pick up either positive or negative. And what happened during the Alum Rock earthquake? Well, here's about a couple of weeks before the earthquake, we started to see a few positive ions coming out, but actually more negative to start with. And then it seemed to transition to a different phase where for 23 hours, our positive ion sensor went off scale. There was a huge influx of ions that occurred right around that site. And we didn't realize that it was happening because we saw this data afterwards. We saw a little bit more after the earthquake, but then it went back to zero again and stayed there for years. Then we, we learned something else. Friedemann said, hey, when those ions hit the air and create uh, earthquake lights or just ionize the air, they can't stay in the excited state very long. They have to hit other molecules and neutralize. And because of the size of the uh, energy of each one of those ions, the amount of energy that comes out turns out to be in the infrared band at eight to uh, 11 micrometers. Just so happened that our friend, the GOES weather satellite, that's sitting over the West Coast, giving us those great pictures every night showing cloud patterns coming in off the ocean. What we don't, didn't realize is that it had an infrared camera on it also. And when it measured the infrared energy coming off of California, it could tell the temperature of the ground. So for example, after sunset, the ground had heated up all day long. If you put your hand on the ground, it might be 80 or 90 degrees. As soon as the sun went down, that ground started cooling down. It was radiating out into cold space. And that, that uh, radiation formed a negative temperature curve. It was the same temperature curve every single night. It might go up or down a little bit, but every night it radiated out into space and it was always, always negative. When we looked at the infrared satellite, um, each pixel was about three kilometers on a side, so it's a little pixelated. But what we saw is the white area was the normal negative slope that we see every night. The yellow area was, was uh, uh, negative or almost negative to zero, 
And then in the positive area, or the pink area rather, it, it would go positive. So if we go down, we can see what's happening. The slope is starting to go positive in that nighttime area. If we go back and forth, you can see the slope going up and that's just counterintuitive. It should always go down. What the satellite was seeing is a influx of infrared energy. If we plotted all of those on the same plot for the Alum Rock earthquake, another interesting feature came out. The blue is air conductivity, the red is infrared, and the black is the pulse count, all normalized to the highest value that we've ever seen. You can see two weeks before the earthquake, all three of those things went off. Then there was a quiet period, just like Tony Fraser Smith had seen. Then it came back up again, just prior to the earthquake and the earthquake hit. So again, one earthquake is not enough. That Elm Rock was really interesting because we got three indicators out of it. Uh, but we decided to do this thing continuously for, uh, turned out 15 years or so. We had 125 stations that we ended up with in California every 20 miles along the major faults. We really got good quality earthquake data from USGS. So that was essential in the uh, statistical analysis to see which earthquakes we could see and which ones we couldn't see. And we found out through trial and error that we had to be within about 20 miles of an earthquake and we had to be above a 4.5 because small earthquakes just don't have enough energy. Now, how do you score this thing? This gets a little bit technical, but I'm gonna to try to make it easy for you to understand. We looked at about 180 earthquake observations. Now, sometimes we would see the same earthquake with two stations. So it's a little less than 180 earthquakes, all greater than magnitude four. And every time an earthquake happened and we saw that double hump pattern, we made a prediction for four days in advance approximately. If we got it, we scored in the vertical direction. If we missed it, the, the score went off to the right. The green line is a, is a chance line. It just says, hey, by random, you know, eventually you're gonna hit one of these earthquakes. But if you can be significantly to this side of the chance line, then you're in a positive area and you've got significance. If you're in the other way, worse than chance, you know, it's not very good. Numerically, we do the area under the curve here. We want that area to be maximized. And when we convert it to a number called sigma, which is sort of the um, um, measure of merit, if you will, in terms of how many bad things happen over a period of a million things. If you were doing semiconductors, you'd wanna have zero failures over, <clears throat> over millions of uh, semiconductors. This area says <clears throat> we're trying to get up to about a magnitude three in that sigma. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the first time we did it, we got a magnitude 2.2, which wasn't bad, but it wasn't as good as we thought we could get. What we did then is we looked at the data that we were collecting and we found out a significant part of seven sensors in the Sierra Nevada were part we're very, very close to a big um, power line that had started up after we put the sensors in the ground. So what we did is we removed the data from those seven noisy sites that were man-made noise, and we just reran the statistical uh, computations, and we got to 3.0, which is evidence that a phenomena does exist but it's not 100% foolproof. It's about 97% um, true that it, that chance couldn't just happen by, by luck and find the same earthquakes. 97% that it wasn't chance. If we get five sigma, then that's an actual discovery. So we're shooting for five sigma, but we haven't gotten there yet. What we did do is we, wrote all of this up in a scientific paper, submitted it for peer review. Other scientists looked at the data, looked at how we did our algorithms, looked at the statistical way and said, yeah, this looks pretty reasonable. I think you've got a, a point here. And we think that we have started to prove that there is a statistical significance, that there is evidence of 
uh, magnetic precursors on the range of four days before the earthquake. It might be five or 10 days, it may be two days, but it's in that one week period. Well, other people, scientists being skeptics, said, well, you know, you really ought to let somebody else look at the data. Maybe you didn't do it right. So we formed a collaboration with a large, well-known big data AI company in Silicon Valley. I'm not gonna tell you their name because we have signed a non-disclosure agreement that we won't tell them their name until they submit their paper for peer review and actually publish it. They've done the paper, they've gone through internal review, they're about to submit it for um, a good journal and have peer review on it. But what they found is they didn't trust anything that we did. They took the data, they looked at the earthquakes and they, they kind of went into it and only picked data that greater than magnitude four that happened be, be between two instrument sites so that both instrument sites saw the same signal coming from the ground. Now these guys are 20 miles apart. So it's not a car going by, it's definitely from underneath the ground. They used all sorts of different um, algorithms to try and see what their forecast would be. And what they did is they took half of the data, half of the 1800, or I'm, I'm sorry, 180 um, observations, took half of that and trained their algorithms on it until they got to a point where they trusted it. Then they took the second half of the, the data, the 90, uh, observations, and they ran that algorithm, the best one that they had, against it just once. And they said, does it work? And the answer was, yeah, it had about the same results. They did say that the signal is pretty small, as you might imagine, because it's coming from 20, 10 to 20 miles below the ground level. But it is statistically significant. If you're gonna transition into an operational standpoint, however, you need to eliminate a lot of the natural noise that the magnetometers are picking up, like lightning, like uh, solar storms, and the man-made noise like trucks and cars going by and uh, cow fences, things like that. Turns out we have a pretty good idea of how to do that, but that's the next step. So in sort of summary now, this is where we are. We've, we've got a developed theory that NASA came out with. Every single thing that Friedman Freund said we should detect, the magnetic fields, the air ionization, and the infrared, we have been able to see over a number of earthquakes. We built this large instrument network, uh, 125 sensors in California. We've got 15 years of data and a number of earthquakes. We've tried dozens and dozens of algorithms and we've got this three sigma correlation, which is really, really positive information. So in the future, we need to reduce the false alarm rate. Um, and we think we can do that because if we combine more of these signals like ionization, infrared, and total electron content from the ionosphere, and if all four of those things go off at the same time, we think we can get to five sigma correlation and transition into an operational mode. Unfortunately, we kind of ran out of money after 20 years of doing this. We're a small company. We're not a government. Uh, we really need some help from the government or private investors that are willing to uh, take a chance on this uh, because it is a very uh, cost intensive effort to keep all of these uh, magnetometers and data flowing and to pay for the people to, uh, to analyze the data. So that's where we are. I uh, want to end up by acknowledging Celeste Ford, Stellar Solutions, we've done, uh, who's done a, a yeoman's job of funding us for 21 years. Uh, NASA also gave us funding for uh, six years. PG&E chipped in some. Tesla gave us a few bucks. Uh, and Telefonica in Peru and Tower Bursama gave us cell phone, free cell phone connectivity. And on the right-hand side, these are uh, some of the people that came up with the uh, the network with the algorithms, with the maintenance of the thing to keep everything running, all the network software and many others that I don't have space to uh, call out here. So thank you for listening. Uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. If you uh, would like to come back after this session and uh, 
send questions to me, I'll glad I'll be glad to answer them. Send them to uh, tblier at quakefinder.com. With that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Tom. That was really super interesting. Uh, I'm sure a number of people are really interested in, in uh, asking a question. I, I have one. I'll kick it off, right? Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm in some plotting. I'm, I'll applaud too. Um, my question is, um, what is the what would be the next step? What would be the sort of the next kind of big aspect of this of this project that you would want to do? Well, I think uh, what we want to do is we've got the algorithms to a reasonable standpoint in terms of the magnetometer. There's a lot of noise in the magnetometer data. We know what a signature of a car looks like. It looks like a heartbeat signal. We know what a uh, lightning looks like because we have independent lightning monitoring. And we know what solar storms look like because all of the monitors see the same storm. If we use that knowledge to create new algorithms, we could subtract all of the pulses that are counted by these noise sources and get down to the essence, the real pulses that are caused by this earthquake process. And then we would want to uh, upgrade our uh, ion sensors to make them a little bit more robust. They get contaminated by dirt after a while and we have to clean them. Um, we would like to get infrared data from the GOES weather satellite. It's available out there. We just didn't have time to look at it all. Um, we'd like to get the um, data from the uh, ionosphere that's uh, uh, generated by the GPS ground sensors and that data is available. But we only had three or four algorithm designers at any one time. This is about a 20 person effort over about another five year period to really move into a operational stage. And that takes money to do that. And that's what we're starting to run out of. COVID did not help us either, by the way. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. So um, uh, does anyone else have a question? I think maybe Karen does? No. Okay. No, thank you for a wonderful presentation. When, I, did, I missed the very beginning of this, when was this study started? Uh, we started building magnetometers in the year 2000. Actually, I started in 1985, but we started with Celeste Ford um, building magnetometers with high schools first, and then uh, professionally in about 2003. So, you know, we've been doing this for about 21 years. Uh -huh. Wow. Well, it's exciting. It is. It, it's probably the most enjoyable part of my career that I've had. Uh, I mean, satellite work is interesting, but this is new stuff and it's, we're discovering things that nobody else has, has ever seen before. And now Shelly was working on this as well, I assume. Okay. Sheldon Briner. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, right. Yeah, I, I know uh, Sheldon and uh, he was primarily doing magnetometer work. Mm -hmm. um, but the trick is, and USGS, by the way, also did this. Uh, they had one sensor in Parkfield. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, they um, took the data at one sample per second. And what we were discovering is that the, uh, the um, pulses that we were seeing were either half a second to about two or three seconds. And you can't really see the shape of that with uh, one, sa one, one sample per second. So when we started collecting data at 32 and 50 samples, 60 samples per second, we really started to see the, uh, the essence of what we were trying to find. Wow. Yeah, wow, that's right. <laughs> Simon um, it has his hand up. Is that, did you want to ask a question, Simon? Yes, Tom, that was a great talk. A very, very clear and lucid presentation of everything. Thank you. Um, what do you think it's going to take to persuade the geophysics community that these signals are real? Well, I think um, we have to have a number of independent teams seeing the same data. Mm -hmm. So I talked about the one independent country uh, company in Silicon Valley that took our data and right. analyzed it. We also have a, uh, a group in Japan, uh, Dr. Hattori, Hattori okay. who, who picked up um, about 100 earthquakes over there in uh, one section of Japan and kind of came up to the same conclusion that you have to be ultra low frequency, you have to be relatively close to the uh, epicenters to pick them up. 
and you have to have the right algorithms to extract the noise. And he published a paper that essentially said the same thing. So we're gonna eventually make this data available to the science community um, probably this coming year. Okay. And we welcome other people to look at the data. It's not easy. <laughs> Well, I, very complex I data. <laughs> Simon, you know, because you've actually looked at some of this data. Yeah. Um, As you know, uh, I am uh, either a believer or an agnostic. Yes. Uh, whereas most of my colleagues in the offices next to me are all atheists. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, believers, unbelievers. Um, and, you know, I think the other issue we have as a community is that although Friedemann's ideas are valid in the domains he makes them, yeah. it is still very hard to understand how to make them work in the real earth that is normally chock full of water, yeah. uh, which ought to short out all his pee holes and anholes. So, he actually he has the work uh, to uh, submerge his samples in water and was able to get the pee holes to migrate through the water. But I understand your point. 10 miles below the surface, it's hundreds of degrees Kelvin down there and the water is saline and you know there's all sorts of complications. We can't get down there that deep to really see what's going on, but we can look at indications on the ground and yeah, it, it's a hurdle to be overcome. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Simon and Tom. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat one of them is, what level of funding would be your minimum need? This is from Karen. Well, we've been um, getting along at about one and a half to $2 million a year, which keeps the network going and builds a network actually, uh, and keeps the people uh, employed that do it. If we really had a full blown team and we upgraded the sensors because they're getting old, some of them are 15 years old now, we would think that we're somewhere in the two to $5 million per year range, which is kind of peanuts for the government and peanuts for <laughs> some large corporations, but it's a lot of money for us. And it's a little bit beyond what we can afford at this point. So two to $5 million for five years is what we're looking at. And uh, Josh uh, Harmson has a question. And uh, Josh, you may have to get off mute to help me out here. Um, the question reads, is it putting out more sensors or is it more annotators? Is that, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to interpret that question, Josh. You might have to jump off mute and ask it. Are we asking for, uh, okay, so annotators analyze the data right. and the sensors are more infrastructure. Right. Uh, so what I'm asking is uh, when, we, when we're asking for funding, are we looking for uh, paying for fund, uh, paying for annotators to analyze data, uh, or is it, or is it more updating the, uh, the, sensors. I guess the sensors that are out in the field? The answer, Josh, is both, and I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Um, the magnetometers are pretty robust; they they hang in there pretty well, but. Some of the uh, analog to digital converters are out of date now. We can't get parts for them anymore. So we have to update those. The cell phones have gone through, you know, version two, three, four, five. We needed new cell phones, um, uh, modems recently. Um, the uh, ion sensors tend to get dirty. Uh, when fog rolls in, they get sort of a, a muddy slurry in there and they, they go off scale. If we have uh, heaters in them, which we can put in, then they last about three years rather than six months. So we need to upgrade the ion sensors and put heaters in them. Uh, and then we need to analyze, uh, people need to analyze the data and run through the statistical process, which is very uh, time consuming um, to, uh, to do all of that. It's, it's much harder than I thought it was going to be, by the way. And uh, we've had some PhDs and um, master's students looking at this for a number of years. And uh, we're making slow progress, but it, it just takes time. Science takes time. Quite a lot of time. So um, I wanna put out a, a call to see if anyone else has any more questions. 
Um, I want to thank everyone, of course, for uh, hanging in there with our Zoom attack. I've never experienced a Zoom attack before. <laughs> that was very amazing. Our, so, hack <laughs> our hackathon. <laughs> yeah, that was that was you know that was science in itself. Like, how does that happen? Okay, but we actually know how it happens. Um, apparently, we were a trending on Twitter. Our our Portola Valley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was trending, our Portola Valley Nature and Science uh, Committee uh, event was trending on Twitter. And uh, so that's how we got a few hackers in, uh, in our midst. Anyway, so uh, I want to thank everyone for hanging in there with that. Um, I'm going to check the chat one more time to see if there's anything else. Um, and Bonnie, this is going to be uh, recorded on the, your website. Yeah, so um, Carrie, our, uh, our website manager and technical contact for the town, um, just a fantastic job with our website for the Nature and Science Committee. And so we have all of our uh, series actually on the website. So you go to portolavalley.net and then uh, under government and town committees, you, uh, you click on Nature and Science Committee and then you can see the, the series that we've, we've been putting forth. Um, we're doing a wild, Dan Quinn is doing a wildflower talk once a month. Um, and that's really interesting if anybody's interested in, in wildflowers. Um, I'm, and I see a number of uh, folks that are on the call tonight that have attended the wildflower talks. So um, Gary Godfrey, I think might have uh, last questions. Um, um, and I'm gonna read this and then Gary, you might have to jump in here and give me a hand. Um, lightning strikes launch shaman waves, which bounce around the world in the Earth ionosphere cavity around seven to eight times per second. Uh, Schumann resonance, right, right. There we go. See, thank you. Uh, <laughs> do, the, do these earthquake events launch Schumann waves? Um, there has been reports that it it may launch um, acoustic waves that can be picked up by um, the atomic. Um, acoustic network that they have out there. Um, I don't know very much about it and I don't know whether or not they can pick it up. What we're detecting, however, are pre-earthquake signals. I think the things that you're talking about are picked up after the earthquake has actually happened. Um, there's a number of vibrations that go around the, the world, both seismic and acoustic. Um, the uh, Schumann resonance uh, you can see that at seven and a half hertz and 15 hertz. Um, these signals that we're seeing are down around uh, one hertz. So they're quite a bit below that. Any others? And that I think hereby ends the questions, unless anyone else has anything else. I'm just going to pause here for a second. See if anyone. Oh, anything there. from Ridgecrest, which is the largest recent earthquake. Um, you, you're not my shill, are you? I just happen to have some <laughs> some charts on that. If, if the Pull people them want to continue on, I, I can go through the Ridgecrest earthquake. Please. Okay. If you're allowed. <laughs> okay. So we okay. roll out. We're officially a one hour program. So we yeah. will in seven minutes. <laughs> and for those of you who wish to stay on and uh, learn a little bit more about this other earthquake, uh, please do. Talk Bonnie, about, how, how will we be able to see the recorded version of this webinar or send send the link to other people that are not uh, able to see it tonight? Yeah, so the, it's uh, being recorded by Zoom. And once the recording is um, made available, the, um, the link will be posted on the Nature and Science Committee website um, at portolavalley.net. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, All I'm right, gonna Bob. flip yeah, into show these. Us, show us another earthquake. Okay. Ridgecrest earthquake. Two big earthquakes, the largest ones after Loma Prieta, 6.2 and 7.1. <clears throat> this is an informal analysis, not quite as rigorous or statistic as the other ones, because it was actually outside of the um, uh, the baseline of, of earthquakes that we had, unfortunately. <laughs> So here's what it looked like. Um, this is a map of the Ridgecrest earthquake area. All of these yellow dots are the uh, main shocks and aftershocks of the Ridgecrest earthquake. Um, these blue circles are the circles that we had uh, active stations going at the time. Remember I told you we took some data out. We actually had sensors right across this <laughs> for a number of years, but it was so contaminated by a uh, 
a 1 million volt power line coming through here, we had to take them out. So we don't have two sensors close by. As a matter of fact, this sensor is about 60 kilometers or 40 miles away. We didn't think we'd pick up anything, but it was a big earthquake. So the Ridgecrest pair of earthquakes were 10.7 and eight kilometers deep, fairly shallow as earthquakes go. And our California site was 60 kilometers to the west outside of this 20 mile range uh, that we thought we had. So we started counting pulses uh, like we do for our normal algorithms. This is counting everything with a very simple algorithm. So we're picking up a lot of noise here in addition to the actual earthquake signals. This down here, this level is kind of where we thought was the background level of that site. And this area happened um, you know, several months before the earthquake. I actually got into this data and stretched it out and looked at it. <clears throat> and there are a number of man-made signals in there because they are repeating. They happen about every 10 seconds, like a pulse. Looks like a pump going on and off that's contaminating the data. And then it goes off for some reason. This area here started to look interesting. There was a pulse, uh, a fairly high pulse count here that went down. And then we saw these two rather really large pulses um, before the earthquake happened over here. And those look really interesting. Now, because we were picking up so much other noise and we weren't algorithmically subtracting them out, I did something that may not satisfy Simon on this, but I went in and I looked at all of the data for 30 days. I took all of the data in two minute segments, five different magnetometer segments, a reference site and the three magnetometers close to the uh, earthquake. And I analyzed every two, two minute segment over 30 days, 78,000 of those that I had to look at. Whenever I saw a solar storm on a reference site, I did not count that pulse. Whenever I saw a repeating pulse caused by the pump or whatever it was there, I did not count that pulse. But every time I saw those typical unipolar pulses that we've seen uh, at some of the other sites, I did count them by hand. And again, we're seeing something on the order of 20 to 40 pulses per day of those kind of pulses coming up uh, occasionally a little bit higher, <clears throat> 23 days before the earthquake, and then a sustained period between six and one days before the earthquake, similar to what we saw before. And then it sort of decreased after the earthquake happened and the strain was released. Um, the other thing that we noticed um, throughout that study was we looked at the, uh, the number of earthquake um, examples that we had at different magnitudes up to 5.5. And this is where we see most of the signatures were around here, around 40, 30 to 40 kilometers away above a magnitude four. So this is four and above. Uh, we didn't have very many samples in the 5.5 uh, and 6.0. So these don't really show too much. Um, but this is sort of the sweet spot justifying the fact that we can, we say that we can only pick up earthquakes from about a magnitude four and above. Um, the man-made noise, those are the things that really drive us nuts. Bay Area rapid transit, we can see those signals almost 100 miles away from the trains. Every time they start up, a magnetometer sees that signal. Cars and trucks are interesting. We can actually pick up the uh, the shape of those signals and subtract them out if we have the right algorithm to do it. We've tried it a number of times and we haven't quite mastered that yet. Anything that's moving, like moving machinery that's repeating, we can get rid of that. Solar storms, all we have to do is look at a remote site like one in, in Peru. It'll see the same PC1 micropulsation that we see here. So we can subtract that out. And we have access to a lightning database from earth networks that allow us to look at lightning up to three or 400 miles away. And if the pulse that we see is at the same exact time as the pulse that they detect, 
we, we can subtract that out. So that's the challenge that we have. We got very small signals in a uh, calliope of noise, and we have to have smart ways of taking all of that noise out to increase the signal to noise ratio of the uh, process. So I'll, I'll end with that. Um, all right. I guess that was, I that was a little my, bit of an indication. My, <laughs> sorry, well, that was my question to you, which was, um, what was what would be your next big project? And that would be removing some of this noisy right, signal. Right. Um, Josh has one last question he'd like to ask, and that is, does Starlink interference interfere? Sorry, does Starlink interfere with what you are reading? Absolutely not. Um, we Starlink? can be next to a radio transmitter, and we don't see it because we're down at one hertz. Um, 60 cycle noise, we filter out uh, dramatically because 60 cycle noise is everywhere. Um, it's the slow moving magnetic fields that drives us crazy, like BART. <laughs> Anything that's up in the satellite uh, at radio frequencies, we, we can't even hear it. Awesome. Um, Tom, I just want to thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Um, I think uh, we're all excited and we learned a lot this evening. So. Um, <laughs> We will, uh, we'll, this, this re will be recorded and will be put on the patrolavalley.net site um, and we'll send the link or, um, you have to, uh, your volume on, right. to uh, the uh, PV forum. All right. Um, one, one more question. Okay. okay. One more uh, question. Uh, are, you, are your pulses, have you, you've looked at a few of them now that are associated with earthquakes. Are they similar enough that you can make a template Kind of a you know a pulse height versus time template that you can run across your data like LIGO does to search for uh, a, 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 this particular pulse shape. We have actually tried that very thing. It's called correlation coefficients. Yeah, and we've tried to do it. Um, the pulses aren't exactly the same all the time. They do stretch out every once in a while, um, and the. Um, PC1 micropulsations from the sun look incredibly similar, but not quite exactly. Uh, we've tried it. We tried to get higher correlation coefficients. It's, we aren't there yet. <laughs> it just didn't work to our, our uh, satisfaction. Thank you, fun talk. Yeah, super fun. I'm gonna uh, stop recording now and I just wanna thank everyone for joining. And yeah, thanks, thanks for, for uh, listening. Tom. Send questions by tblyer at quakefinder.com if you have any more. Over and out.